I just wish that everybody could walk through this space. Not with the purpose of getting somewhere, but with the purpose of being in the space. Because when you slow down, when you begin to engage with this architecture, it moves you deeply. It really has the effect of a great spiritual presence. The first time I walked into this building, I was just amazed at both the volume of space and the sense that one has when walking into a mission church. My favorite place in the library are the reading rooms. The way in which they ennoble education by evoking the mission churches of the past, invoking the seriousness of education, to me, they're really the heart of the university. I don't think there's another building, public building, private building, that has this quality anywhere in New Mexico, or in the world for that matter. Very few public buildings are built with the attention to hand craftsmanship that Zimmerman Library was focused on. I just don't think that a building like this would be built today. Nowhere do you have this sense of history, this sense of tradition, this sense of blending of cultures into one building. It's not about a modern building, it's not about colonial. This is a blending of our Native American heritage, of our Hispanic heritage, of our Anglo heritage, all together in a building. Ivy League universities, major state institutions, look to us to maintain a collection on Latin America. UNM is recognized as the collector of Latin American art and art history. We still have a million visitors come into this facility every year, and each and every one of them, I think, takes away a piece of something that's special to them about Zimmerman. I do love this building. I love walking through these corridors, through the reading rooms, and enjoying the, the wonderful spaces that are here. When you look at it from the outside, it's as if this building actually seeps out of the earth. When this building was built, all of a sudden, it changed the nature of this campus. You know, it really made it a university. Zimmerman was UNM's third library. The first library was in a small, poorly lit room on the first floor of Hodgen Hall. It was still in its small quarters when Wilma Loy Shelton came to the campus in 1920. She saw the desperate need for a new facility. And by 1926, UNM had its first official library building. But the demand for books was so great, it outgrew itself almost at once. Soon, a new library was essential. That tradition of the value of books and the value of the written word um, dates back to the earliest colonial era. And now with Zimmerman Library, with the construction of this library, suddenly there was this place where they were accessible to everybody. Ground for the new construction was broken in 1936, and two years later, students and faculty carried books with ceremony from the old library to the new towering building. Well, the libraries are the center of the universe. They both represent the university, they celebrate the university. This building just says so much about that transition from the old world of New Mexico into the new world in New Mexico. And the most important thing, if we're gonna keep New Mexico living into the future, is that we never forget where we came from in the past. It doesn't take much to imagine the early beginnings. Higher education in New Mexico needed a champion and it found one in Bernard Shandon Rohde. Only 32 years old in 1889, Rohde wrote the legislation and fought for UNM to be located in Albuquerque. Two days before the end of the session, Rohde and his stenographer were still hammering away on the bill in Santa Fe's old Palace Hotel. 
And just before adjournment, the legislation was passed and the University of New Mexico was born. It wasn't long before 20 acres were donated on this site and the fledgling university finally had its own place on the Mesa. It was designed in this wonderful uh, Richardsonian Romanesque, almost from the Byzantine tradition and the Romanesque tradition, uh, with wonderful vaulted arches and um, a heaviness and a solidity that probably at the time symbolized the university's here to stay. It was the first blossom on the Mesa, a beautiful building that opened its doors to 108 students. The Renickel is a horse and buggy that, that transported students from downtown up to the main campus, and this, of course, preceded the dormitories. Then came Dr. William George Tight, UNM's third president, aptly called the Human Dynamo. He believed this site on the hill could one day be an academic oasis in the wilderness, a place that would stand as the world's finest example of what would come to be called the Spanish Pueblo style of architecture. All along, there had been bitter hostility to Dr. Tite's plans. And as Dr. Charles Hodgen pointed out, people didn't mind going back several thousand years to copy Greek architecture, but they could not tolerate what belonged to their own land. Hodgen Hall was the first building built on the campus and it was red brick and it looked like all of the school buildings from New York to Kansas City. It's, it's amusing to see them copying the Greek architecture or colleges and campuses in the Northeast. In 1904, Tite seized the opportunity to remodel this red brick building in the Spanish Pueblo style, when a local architect found the original roof to be too heavy and unsafe. But even after the transformation, UNM regents never embraced the idea that this was the best way to help create a proud cultural identity for New Mexico. And in 1909, Tite was forced to resign. His dream of a Pueblo on the Mesa was to wait several more years. A lot of the citizens resented it, and they protested, that, you know, why in the world would a, a university with its eye on the future build buildings modeled after a culture like the Indians or the Hispanics? You need to remember that after the railroad arrived in 1880, uh, entire communities modernized and Americanized, and they, they built an Italianate revival, Richardsonian Romanesque. Uh, it really turned the, the towns, you know, even the Santa Fe Plaza, into Main Street anywhere. But he was the first institutional leader who said, no, we should do something that's uh, distinctive to our state, that expresses our culture that reinforces uh, a commitment to our history, our cultures, our living communities. Campus planning from 1909 until 1927 proceeded in a haphazard fashion, due partly to lack of finances and partly to continuing hostility against Spanish Pueblo architecture. It wasn't until Dr. James Zimmerman assumed the presidency in 1927 that a new building program was introduced not only were there no apologies for the architecture of these buildings, the style was actually celebrated by the presence at the dedication ceremonies of all the Indian Pueblos in the state. Zimmerman made a talk in which he said that he wanted to build some larger buildings and not continue to build these small buildings which were sprouting up around the campus and make it into a real university. Zimmerman's vision had to wait. Soon after his speech came the stock market crash of 1929, and by 1932, the economy was in a deep depression. A year later, Franklin D. Roosevelt gave the country hope with his New Deal program of 1933, including many programs that were to have a profound effect on New Mexico. The Federal Art Project, I think, was one of the most long-lasting of the programs. Therefore, it had the greatest benefit for New Mexico. It was an opportunity to celebrate people for the skills that they had, uh, to bring to New Mexico a sense of worth in traditional art forms. During this time, architect John Gaw Meem 
who had become well-known regionally for his refinement of the Spanish Pueblo style of architecture, had been hired as the university architect and given his first UNM commission. The three first great buildings that Neem did on campus, a student union building, Skulls Hall, and Zimmerman Library, uh, would not have been constructed without su federal support. So uh, when it became apparent that the New Deal was going to make funds available for such projects, uh, then President Zimmerman uh, and John Gaumin developed a plan for the campus. Yes, he was well, about 36 or something. And all of a sudden, these big commissions came in. And he was in conversations with the University of New Mexico with President Zimmerman, who had heard of some money for big public projects. He was the university architect for 26 years, uh, I think it was 33 to 59. And during that time, I think he found that was a wonderful opportunity to uh, really work on uh, President Tights and President Zimmerman's vision of the university. I'm sure it was an absolute delight for him to do. I was very excited when I got to be a teenager and had to come to Albuquerque to get braces. <laughs> and my father was busy working here at the university and we would go to the Alvarado Hotel for lunch always because he thought the coffee at the Alvarado Hotel was absolutely super and I thought that the hamburgers were fabulous. <laughs> The breadth of John Gaumim's contribution to shaping the Spanish Pueblo style of architecture becomes clear through an appreciation of his life. He was born in Brazil, educated in Virginia, and while living in New York, was diagnosed with tuberculosis. He walked out of the doctor's office at age 26, being told that he had a life-threatening disease. He was walking down Fifth Avenue past Rockefeller Center, and he passed a Santa Fe railway station office and saw big posters of maces in the window and he just decided to walk in the door and buy a ticket. Three days later he was in New Mexico and he used to tell me the story of how that first night he crawled into bed and pulled up the blankets and there were all these sparkles inside in his blankets. He called them stars in my blankets <laughs> and he thought that was that was really exciting. He came to the Southwest at a very formative time of his life and, and saw all the great beauty that we have here and he began kind of molding that, that style that he is so, uh, was so, so popular. I think that both President Zimmerman and John Gaumin saw the library uh, as the great landmark that they were constructing. They put all of their best work and their best resources into the building. So for instance, there are nearly 250 detailed drawings for the execution of walls, parapets, carved wood detail, far more than any other building. So we had to figure out how to make these, these buildings evocative of New Mexico's. And uh, he did that by gently battering the walls of the tower, and there is a whole series of drawings. They're done; it's done very, very carefully. It wasn't just uh, hither thither. It was really carefully designed to gently evoke the softness that happens when adobe is washed by rain, and the parapets are gently softened. John Gamim saw that the campus needed a focal point, needed a center, and what better, more important, more relevant building to put at the center of the campus than this Cathedral of Learning. Perhaps his greatest genius was his sense of space and proportion, and because of the WPA, he had the ability to do these extraordinary details. What Meme created here and what the builders who built off of his drawings did is unmatched. John Gamin, being the designer that he was, drew out the designs that he needed for particular places, and the vocational schools were received those drawings and were expected to execute them. 
there was money to pay craftsmen and artists. He, he could draw these amazing details and they could, could do it. These authentic and symbolic Indian carvings were the work of three skilled young Indian youths, Faustin Talachi, Justin Yazi, and Daniel Mirabel. And Aban Lucero was responsible for the creation of dozens of works of art in Zimmerman Library. His name was identified with quality. So when he became a teacher at the vocational schools, there was this sense that for the students that they got to study with the great furniture maker, Abad Lucero. In the era of value engineering, there's so much about this building that simply wouldn't be permitted and the budget would be, would be squeezed out at the last minute, all the wooden detailing, for, for instance, that simply would not be tolerated in this day and age. Zimmerman was so well designed, and it set a precedent for this university campus for 40, 50 years. It sits in the middle of the campus now, exactly where John Gamim thought it should be, and um, it's the heart. This building's like a great church in, in, in Europe. I mean, it's, it's an architectural gem. It's a beauty. You want to walk in here just to be here. It brings some you know, special emotions and feelings, and um, it's, it's a special place to be. The building itself looks historic in many ways, but it also looks modern. And you see in every detail the hand of humanity, the hand of the makers that made this building. And it says New Mexico in a very bold way. The controversy over the murals are, erupts every couple of years. Uh, last year I had a long string of emails with a student about uh, the murals and whether or not they should be removed. I don't think they should be removed because they are part of our history. And I don't think we learn from history by sanitizing it and papering it over. I think we need to continue to talk about them. We have done a good deal of research into what we believe were the artist's intent. There are two major components to the conception of the murals. One is that it's this visual distillation of the rhetoric of the three cultures, Native American, Hispanic, Anglo, living together in harmony. And the second is the, the use of the 19th and 20th century uh, ideological formulation of the progress of, of civilization. The Native Americans are shown uh, busy at work on their, their handcrafts, uh, on Pueblo bowls, on Navajo blankets, on Apache baskets. Uh, the Hispanics are shown plowing a field and plastering an adobe wall. The third panel, the Anglo-Americans, uh, are shown with electric lights, with microscopes. So I think you can see that the Native Americans are placed into a pre-industrial past. The Hispanics are shown as farmers and laborers, and the Anglo-Americans uh, are shown as possessing the most cutting edge science and technology. After the civil rights movement gained speed, young Chicano activists began to notice um, that the only people with uh, eyes uh, were Anglo-Americans in the images. These murals were created uh, with the best of intentions. So from the point of view of President Zimmerman and the artist um, Kenneth Adams, what had been acceptable in the 1930s became a matter of, of uh, contention by the early 1970s. There's still a significance in the murals and a, a beauty in the art itself that we need, I believe, to protect and to teach people about. It's important that they not be accepted, you know, as a, as a kind of ideology that the university embraces. Rather, they should be used 
very explicitly as a teaching tool in a way that illuminates our, our history. President Zimmerman resented the constant comparisons to Eastern institutions, knowing full well that it took Harvard and others hundreds of years to get where UNM was in half a century. Like Dr. Tite before him, Zimmerman wanted to fit the school to its environment. One of the things that Zimmerman realized uh, was that the state had a much deeper, richer history as part of Spain's New World Empire than it did as, as part of the United States. And so he wanted to develop that and exploit that in an academic way, in a scholarly way. Zimmerman advanced his vision by offering Dr. Joaquin Ortega, a nationally recognized educator, the directorship of the newly created School of Inter-American Affairs. Joaquin Ortega saw New Mexico the way Zimmerman did, that it was uniquely positioned to serve as a kind of bridge, as Ortega put it, between South America and the rest of the United States. In the 1930s, when Zimmerman made a decision that we're going to focus on Spanish America and Spanish American resources, the idea was to provide for people a history that is overlooked in the rest of the United States and often in the rest of the world. President Zimmerman personally became engaged in this effort, and he was remarkably successful, making UNM a center of excellence for inter-American studies. The Latin American collection at UNM is among the top five in the nation. And in terms of art and graphic work, we're one of the best in the country. I was told while I was working at the center that we had one of the finest collections, and it didn't really dawn on me until I really started to appreciate what there was and doing research in these collections myself. That's where I realized how much of a jewel we really have. In the Center for Southwest Research and Special Collections, we have a couple different collecting areas. We document the history of this university. So we have the original uh, Board of Regents minutes going back to 18th, 19th century, the handwritten minutes of the board. Uh, another part is our photograph collections. We probably have 150,000, 200,000 photographs, and they deal with Native American subjects, uh, New Mexico landscapes, New Mexico towns. Every summer, we have scholars from Europe all over the country come here to go through our papers because we're the only place who has them, and that really makes it a, a world-class institution. There's so much content out there. There's so much available out there. The intellectual output seems daunting. So one of the large challenges for libraries is to help students and faculty determine what is authoritative, you know, what is really the best. We just completed our third mural on the outside of our Indigenous Nations Library program. And it has many metaphors. One of them is that there are indigenous librarians that are hired here at Zimmerman specifically to help students. They have the helping hand for you to reach out that there's a resource here for them. We have attempted to claim the space in a way that's artistic, in a way that's relevant, in a way that's spiritual. So to come to Zimmerman and to be in one of the grandest locations and to be able to paint here you know, it seems beyond ordinary reality. When your senses are filled to capacity and you have to go beyond what you can think you can do, that's when you have really succeeded in education. Three million is a major milestone for any library. We actually have the second book we ever bought. It's still in the stacks. People are still using it today. So when you think about a library, you think about an accumulation of knowledge. Today, if you tried to say, we're going to build a library and get three million books, it would almost be impossible. And if you think about it, the, the value, this is probably one of the biggest assets in New Mexico. We see these buildings as repositories of books, but behind the scenes, librarians are on the cutting edge of knowledge transfer. 
and knowledge is power. The most important thing that I can do is to preserve this building as close as possible to the original design that Meme Incorporated in 1938. What's wonderful about the 75th anniversary is that this is just the beginning. Thousands of students have come through this building, have learned, have fallen in love, have had adventures and had experiences that they, that they have kept all their lives. And it continues to go forward into the 100th anniversary. Zimmerman Library says, I'm American, but specifically, I'm New Mexico American. And the building has a grandness that welcomes people from the historic period through the present and into the future. And I think that this building will stand the test of time because it knows what it is. It speaks volumes by speaking its own language.